Good morning. <laughs> That's better. So I'm a taxonomist, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm careful about meaning. So a hack can be an elegant and simple solution with a big impact, right? Does that make sense? Yes? Or it can be an intrusion into a secure system. <laughs> I think both work, right? I mean, there's nothing more secure than a uh, change-resistant culture. <laughs> so, so what we'll do uh, over the next, I think we have a hard stop at uh, 9.45 for the next keynote. What we'll do is uh, I've asked each of our um, panelists to share uh, an example of a successful hack and a failed hack. So we get balance, something that worked, something that didn't work. Um, we'll do a round robin, we'll do five minutes each, starting with Gloria, and then maybe we, we move on to Jean-Claude and then uh, Jay. Um, and then we'll move from that into figuring out what does all this mean and what are the themes and, and how do they, and do we agree? Mm -hmm. uh, and as I say, please do tweet in uh, questions or challenges as we go. So, Gloria. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think for my success hack, I'd like to shift your mindset from approaching KM from the what and the how and talk to you about the why. Um, I'm a senior manager at uh, Deloitte, but the story that I'm going to tell you precedes my coming on board um, and really encapsulates um, a journey that I took back in 2009 for a global technology services company that basically wanted to transform the way that they were connecting their employees, the way employees were collaborating, and how the company was going to innovate. So my first meeting at the company was actually with the CIO and the CEO of the company. And I was curious to know what were the business objectives that the company had. Yes, they told me they wanted to transform, but what were they trying to achieve in the market? What were they trying to achieve internally? Um, and I asked in that meeting, could I have full access to all of your leaders of all of your business units and your internal services organizations? I wanted to meet with them to understand that they understood the mission and what were the, the problems that they were encountering it was very important for me to understand the why we were going about the transformation. Being a KM leader, I think sometimes we're so close to knowledge assets uh, that we don't stop and think, how or why are we collecting these? Many times I t I, I've heard in, in that business and other businesses, well, we're gonna collect all proposals or we're gonna collect all qualifications, but why? What are the ones that are most important to the business? What is gonna drive the, the lasting impact? So going through this, this journey, um, I had a workshop and I brought in a stakeholder from every part of the business to prioritize what those requirements were and what the needs of the business were. And it really changed the path forward of how we were gonna go about KM and what processes we were gonna use because we defined the why up front we took it down to another level. I needed to understand how the end users, what was it like for a programmer project manager a day in the life? And this was before the popular, um, I think t today we call it journey mapping, employee journey mapping. But back in 2009, 2010, it was really just understanding that, you know, what is a day in the life of the different significant roles in that company? and why would they want to change their behavior to share openly and transparently? Why do they want to connect with an SME? And I found out very quickly that the end user was telling me it's not so much the, the what and the how. I could read a manual, I could figure out how to do it, but why did someone take a certain approach in a project? Uh, a project manager said, for me, yeah, I've got the explicit content in front of me, but I want to have that conversation with a subject matter expert that could help me understand the why something's being done some way. So um, come to 
the part of the technology. Being a technology services business, they had a fantastic technology platform, all the bells and whistles. Um, it looked at how do we knit together all of the processes so that we bring the knowledge to the place where the practitioner or the end user is actually working. So the roadmap became, okay, now I know the why, I know the business requirements, I know the pain points. Let me bring all this knowledge and present it to the person who's going to use it. Taking this approach, and I'll go right to the end result, we were able to drive with this new collaborative platform that we put into place a 91% adoption rate for 17,000 of the 23,000 employees across 100 countries around the globe within 18 months of deploying the platform, which was astonishing in 2010. The result was really driven because we focused on people first and why they were going to use the knowledge assets rather than approaching it from, we have this great technology solution, we're gonna put it in, we're gonna flip a switch, and everybody's going to use it. Unless you really socialize at a role-based level why it matters to an employee to change their behavior, to share or to use the technology tools that you're putting out there, you're always going to hover around a 35% adoption rate if you're lucky. So my, my hack is focus on the why, focus on the people, and you'll get the results that you need with the program that you're putting in place. Okay, so I'm going to jump in there because you've used up your five minutes yes. on the success. Uh, so keep your failure in reserve. Can I jump to Jean-Claude? And since we haven't heard about a failure, do you mind sharing your failure first? Would that be all right? Uh, Jean-Claude, anyone from Texas here, by the way? Yeah. Jean-Claude is our representative from the great state of Texas. So Texan citizen. Old Texan. Uh, you may not believe it from his accent, but this is the case. Thank you. So... I guess you're all familiar with Microsoft, uh, maybe a little bit less familiar with Microsoft Services. So let me just give you the context. Microsoft Services is the largest uh, division of Microsoft. We are 21,000 people, and we are a professional services organization, very much like Deloitte, or mini Deloitte, right, and so on. So our people, what they do, they help customers basically uh, to realize uh, you know, the, the best of the technology that we produce. Uh, in, and what, what really is interesting for me is I have the great privilege to talk to a lot of customers because the question is how does Microsoft do knowledge management? So I've probably talked to 50 customers in the last uh, two years sharing how we do things and I don't like to call it uh, best practice but there's a very, very recurrent theme which is people think that change management is an item, line item on a program. Change management is the program. So the biggest failure I see, and probably also internally, I mean, we've been doing uh, the Knowledge Management Initiative for 11 years. So we started very much with the why and the embedding things, the community of practice, which are very vibrant. But the problem here is, is that why are so many knowledge management initiatives failing? It's because people just throw technology at problems. And technology is maybe 30% of the solution. If you don't have the culture, if you don't have the change management, and I'll talk about what we've done in that space and the process, it will be failure. We belong to an organization called TSIA, Technology Services Industry Association. They've made a survey in 2014 that 50% of CAM initiatives failed the first year, and two-thirds in the next three years. Imagine how much money is being wasted there and, and, and knowledge that is being wasted there. So a little maybe tip, a hack for not falling into the trap of knowledge management, there is a very good uh, methodology called ADCAR. Who is familiar with ADCAR here? Show of hand. One, two, three, okay. <laughs> There's anything? Okay. It's, it's, we like to say at Microsoft that we drink our own champagne. I don't like the <laughs> It's maybe my French side also. But so we drink our own champagne. In my team, there is a certified adoption and change management person from a methodology we, we actually uh, license from ProSide. And we use this ADCAR model. The A stands for awareness, but the D is very, very important is desire, the desire for change. What Gloria was mentioning is that you throw a new system and you say, why don't we do a training for that new system? 
Why? Why, why, do you, why do I have to learn that new system? I don't even know. What's in it for me? So whenever you do something in knowledge management, you have the question, start with what's in it for me, the employee, the person, right? Yeah. So that's the biggest failure. So I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank you. And, and since we're on one story each, I'm going to move to Jay. <laughs> Thank you. You, want, you prefer uh, that I start with success or failure? Or? I, you know, I think, I think we're even on this. <laughs> so you didn't okay. want me to say that SharePoint is the reason of our success? 30% <laughs> of the reason. <laughs> Jay. Well, Jay. I'll, I'll start with a success and, and dovetail into a failure. And uh, uh, the, um, I guess as, as a panelist, uh, I'm, I'm a little different in that I'm with the university. So I'll first talk about uh, maybe a successful story at a university, and then uh, dovetail into uh, perhaps a bittersweet kind of failure story with a government agency. So, um, so the story involves uh, uh, my previous university uh, called University of Maryland University College, UMUC, whose original charter was to educate uh, military across, <coughs> across the world. Uh, there are about 90,000 students in 28 countries. Uh, most of the faculty are adjunct. About 92% of the courses are taught through e-learning uh, or blended learning, but uh, mostly e-learning. And, um, and so the stories involve uh, community building and silo busting. So you may not believe it, but I would say the university has uh, the greatest silos of probably any type of institution. And, um, and so what I was brought on uh, in my position to help foster research and scholarship uh, and build kind of a culture, even though our core mission was for teaching. So to do that, and since we had many adjunct faculty across the world, uh, we were able to start a, a research grant program, uh, about $100,000 <clears> as seed money for each semester uh, that would allow the adjunct faculty to collaborate and cut across and kind of build a stronger sense of community with the full-time faculty. And <clears throat> uh, it was the first time that the adjuncts were involved in, in kind of uh, building this community. And it worked out very nicely. We, we gave uh, more money if you were able to um, as, uh, put in proposals <clears throat> with colleagues across other you know, disciplines. And, uh, and so that kind of led to um, uh, something that we called the share fair, which uh, we borrowed from the World Bank and other organizations where the faculty who did receive uh, research grants at the end of the uh, year, we had a venue where uh, the faculty would then present through uh, uh, poster sessions, knowledge cafes, moderated round, ta uh, round table discussions. We had uh, various recognition reward initiatives in, um, for learning and knowledge sharing behaviors. And, uh, and that was very successful. It was both virtual and face-to-face. -face. And again, it was to really uh, cut across these silos and allow people to establish relationships outside of their own discipline. Because as we know from social network analysis or, or ONA types of projects, usually the innovation comes from outside your own area. And so this led to, um, Various outcomes, we had uh, a number of multi multidisciplinary research grants, new cross-cutting programs, um, <clears throat> increased um, public, joint publications. So uh, in the university environment, uh, it was very, I think, successful and something a little different. Uh, the failure very quickly is that um, I was involved as an IEEE <clears throat> executive fellow <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with a government agency uh, right here in town. And uh, we were asked to do a knowledge audit and develop a knowledge management strategy for, uh, for the uh, uh, agency. 
And um, this was under the auspices of the chief technology officer. And again, we didn't want to push technology, so we engaged the managing director. Uh, and the bottom line, since time is short, is we had about 70% uh, response rate across the agency, which was phenomenal. Uh, but the, the issue was it was a failure in that just timing wasn't appropriate. Uh, about three months later, there was a new administration coming in. Um, there were a number of other priorities and similar to you know, what you're seeing now. And so just the timing wasn't right. Uh, so to me, it's kind of a bittersweet story. Uh, we weren't able to really um, activate this strategy. Uh, the good news though is that the new CIOs come in actually has a very strong KM background. So maybe, you know, maybe that will be resurrected. Okay, can I just, um, uh, I think it, there's a comment on Twitter that said, and I'm not gonna say who you are, uh, your, your comment that universities have some of the greatest silos ever. Uh, one of our uh, participants here says, we do silos very well in DOD too. <laughs> um, how many of you are with government agencies? So is your advice, Jay, that these folks should just stop what they're doing for a while? Because there's a new administration coming in, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting times. I was in Europe this past week, and, um, and so we probably saw the election results before most people here in the States. But um, uh, no, I think, um, I mean, there's a transition period, as, as you're seeing. Um, and so, you know, as going back to timing, uh, there will be certain priorities that will come into play. And we already see that, you know, in, in some of the plans of the president-elect. So you kind of have to, you know, pick your, uh, right. your pockets, your niches. Right. So and it's kind of looking at the horizon and what's coming, as well as at the people and you know, the, the, the different levels of right. uh, desire and, right. and uh, need and so on. So um, you need that strategic alignment is, is what right. I'm saying. I, I'm just curious, if, if you, because I have a question here, any hacks to share around KM in the unique industry of higher education, which came in just as you started. It's yeah. almost as if he tweeted directly I, into your brain. I, I, <laughs> um, I didn't have a plant out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, how would you, why did that work given just in, in, a, in a brief nutshell, yeah. why did that uh, exercise work, do yeah. you think? Well, I think for two reasons. The f first, there was just a, um, a craving for the need for building a stronger, I think, sense of community and belonging, particularly with all the faculty worldwide who may not have been in touch as closely to kind of our headquarters here so, in the DC so you, so you area. So you were tapping into an underlying need. I think so. Yeah. So I think that's you know one reason. The other reason is uh, we had this support of our senior leadership, and um, so that kind of helped pave the way. But I think there was just um, uh, you know a great need that a latent need, but it was it was evident, right. and so we were kind of tapping into that. Okay. Um, I have a clarification question uh, for you, Gloria. Um, did I hear Gloria say 35% adoption is a success? No, I said it's uh, what I think is the status quo. I think if you don't focus on culture, um, you, you, know, you can expect to hover between 28 and 35% adoption, and then you're going to stall. If you don't address that, what's in it for me at the different levels that I was talking about, you know, what's in it for the, the company? What's the business value overall from a senior leadership perspective, from an organization leadership perspective, from the key roles, and from the end user? If you don't socialize that value, what's in it for me? Then you're never going to get everyone to come to the table and say, I'm, I'm going to adopt this new behavior. Okay, cool, thank you. Uh, Jean-Claude, um I'm directing that it wasn't specifically directed at you. It's a tweet from Daniel Bryan saying, but you, you did mention technology for some reason. Yeah, it, uh, but I, the, the tweet actually, is this. I'd like to rebond on a silo because I, this is another theme I see everywhere. We yeah. all, I mean, let's face it, we all have silos, right? So what, what was the hack? What, what did we do? Even at Microsoft, there mm. were silos, right? So what did we do? I think there's three things that I can talk about. First one was 
on the people side, the behavior. Mm. What is the ultimate behavior of good knowledge collaboration, right? It's to share your knowledge and have other people willing to reuse your knowledge. If the, only the first one doesn't work, right? So we've been sharing knowledge, putting a lot of things in SharePoint, and nobody's reused, right? What's the motivation? What, how do you make it intentional? How do you make it part of the culture? So what we did in Microsoft, we changed our reward system. We changed our performance management and development system where we reward financially. We reward people who share knowledge and reuse knowledge. Right? And we have meeting on a quarterly basis with our team and we said, what did you do, Gloria, last month to uh, reuse knowledge from others to create a bigger impact? Show me. And show me what you have shared of your knowledge to help other people create a bigger impact and grow. And once you make that transformation, you see a spirit. It started three years ago, and you see the result of innovation right now. Because innovation is when you reuse ID. Innovation is not invention, right? Which is the creation of ID. Innovation is reusing an ID from other in a different context, the adjacent and so on. And I think that's one of the fundamentals that we've seen. The second thing you talk about technology, uh, I'd like to process for a second quickly, is that what we are doing is that we want to embed the principle of sharing and reusing in the way people work. What APQC would say, for those of you who are APQC member, it says for a for key practitioner is, is the transfer the knowledge in the flow of work, right? I like to be more English-like, even though I have a, a Texan accent, is, uh, you know, really, uh, can I make it so that, you know, it's in the way I work? Let me give an example. Every time we do a project for a customer, right, there's a project collaboration site where people can actually, not all are consistent. It can't be that our consultant, our architect, our technical specialist knows every single product of Microsoft. No way. So the knowledge management system you put in place is to connect those people with knowledge. How do you do that? When they select a knowledge kit, we launch a query on the system and we identify all the projects that are in flight in all the company that are using that knowledge. And then we provide a little card index with the name of the project, the people who are in the project, and the presence. You can right click on the name of that person and connect with a person that is using that technology. And that's embedded in the process. It's not like, well, go into that system, find the expertise locator, do this. This doesn't work. You have to embed into the way people work. And the third one is technology. We moved to the cloud two years ago. And why did we move to the cloud? Because number one, the cloud is agility. You've seen yesterday, or those who were here yesterday for the keynote, we talk about Airbnb, right? Those are transformative, disruptive industries that are created almost overnight. We could have talked about, you know, Uber, which has a market cap equal or superior to Avis and Hertz combined. Uh, Bitcoin in the finance industry, right? So uh, the cloud is the place where you have the ultimate mobility there. And the second thing is that you have this agility at scale and security at scale. When I was a CIO uh, many years ago, I was uh, in, in a semiconductor company, fifth largest semiconductor company, had four people for security, four people. We have 400 people just in a cyber security center. So, so you're saying cloud is more secure than... I think that we, when you have the ability to scale security like we do, I think cloud is far more secure than many installation, even my own previous installation. Okay, so there's another argument of going to the cloud, which is that sometimes it's a way of sidestepping your internal IT. No, I think it's, <laughs> I mean, think about... So there, was a, there was a long, slow silence there. People are trying to figure out, <laughs> is, that, um, is that kosher or not? Um, um, but but I, I, wanna, I want to segue into a question that came from the tweets, Daniel Bryan. Um, any experience where the KM analyst role was in IT? If so, have you seen success? And are there any tips for somebody in that role? I'm guessing, Daniel, are you in IT? 
Where, is Daniel here? Mm -hmm. He's over here. Are you in IT? Okay. So do we have any tips for you, Daniel? Yeah, I, I have one. Yes, good. So one thing that we did on our platform, first of all, is to embed uh, analytics in the knowledge collaboration platform. So from a, and you have to make the distinction in analytics between our knowledge management analytics, which is the behavior that you track, how many people share, reuse, rate, uh, what's the adoption, and then the business impact. So to Gloria's point is that the, one of the most successful way to, to <coughs> basically embed knowledge management in your business is to ask, work with the business leader, what problem are you trying to solve? And I come with my bag of trick of knowledge things and I help you solve that. When, when the answer comes to what problem, what will be the metric? And so you're not trying to justify why you do knowledge management. You have an agreement, what is the goal? Let's say that uh, you want to improve um, the proposal process in sales. So you want to reduce the time and you want to improve the win rate. You can do a base and say today the time is 90 days and uh, our win rate is uh, 40%. Okay, I want it to improve by 20%. Okay, so that's the analytic that you want to do. So don't mix the two analytics, but know what the people are doing. Are the people really sharing? Are the people really reusing knowledge? Because if the people are only sharing knowledge and nobody's reusing, what the heck? You need to have those two things happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jay. yeah ju just to piggyback uh, what Jean-Claude was saying, I, I was involved <clears throat> uh, the past few months with a, a book called Successes and Failures of Knowledge Management, and, and one of Patrick's colleagues from Bangkok University, uh, Vincent Ribier, has a nice chapter where he interviewed about 34 uh, KM experts <clears throat> throughout the world. Uh, some of you might be here. Uh, and they found about 111 reasons why KM efforts fail or may have difficulty. Uh, and then they clustered those into seven buckets. <clears throat> and one of the top buckets looked at culture. Uh, and then others were measurable you know, benefits and uh, standardization. But a, but a key theme that kept arising from many of uh, the contributors uh, in their research looked at process. So IT is great, but you know, if you don't have processes in place, uh, you know, you're gonna sub-optimize. So it's so important that you really look at process you know, as, a, as a critical component. I, and I, I, I'm not really a panelist. I'm just supposed to be you know, managing Twitter here. Um, but I, I do have an experience of a, a, somebody from an IT background who was very successful in KM. I, actually, this guy came out of an IT security background, interestingly enough. And I think the two key factors that drove his success in KM was, first of all, um, he was responsible for IT security, so he knew how difficult it was to change people's behaviors. <laughs> uh, and and so, he, so he did start exactly the way you uh, suggested starting, with talking to people and figuring out what, where were the pain points and so on. The other was, uh, he had an advantage that, is that he actually understood what the technology could and couldn't do. So when it came to figuring out how the technology could be deployed to support the KM, he was being realistic uh, about his, you know, how much scale he could do, how, what kind of time frame, how to implement, how to fold it into the, the way that work is actually being done. So I think there are, there are examples where uh, an IT role can I, be an I, advantage, I would agree. Right? You know, in my role as CKO at the technology company, um, I had responsibility for the intranet and the extranet. So I had a very, very close partnership with IT. Mm. And it was essential, as you said, to embed it into keep, keep business process so that you're not having your employees have to go somewhere to share knowledge. You want to bring it into the flow of how they go about their, their daily work so that it becomes natural, it becomes the DNA that I'm going to share what I've developed because it'll make it easier for my colleague who's going to go through the same steps you know, two weeks from now for an, a, another business reason. So integrating it into new hire onboarding, integrating it into the employee life cycle. How do you tap what someone knows throughout their entire journey with your company? 
I see so many companies, and this is a, a failure, where you wait till the last minute when you have your engineering services, a great portion of your staff is going to retire. You're going to wait until three months before they're going to exit to tap 30 years of their knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's something that you should embed in the process of, of gleaning that knowledge and sharing that knowledge throughout their entire life cycle. The same with um, engagement management. You want to have the good practice of capturing the engagement assets as the team is working through the engagement. Don't wait until the engagement wraps up. They're going to be ramped on to a new project on Monday and you're asking them Friday to write a qualification or a case study. Um, they're already focused on, gee, I need to book my flight to be in Cincinnati next week. Uh, so again, if you embed it in that whole process of the engagement, it becomes part of what they're doing with their, their role as an engagement manager. They basically have a knowledge manager within the engagement and you're, you're capturing as you go along. So make it easy. I, I think the failure is that sometimes groups or communities sit over here and people are working over here in a team room. Why aren't you bringing that discussion, that feed into where they're working? There's a, we, we seem to separate the two. You know, tacit conversations and, and exchanges happen over here in my my ESN, and this is where people are working over here. Why aren't you integrating them together through business process integration, right? Okay. Um, Can we talk about process a little bit? Because we're uh, well, maybe. But, um, See, I'm not asking to talk about technology. I'm asking. No, I, I just want to run. I just want to run that point up. But that, that we've been reminded by somebody that in the KM Jeopardy session last year, uh, there was apparently universal acclaim for wanting KM to sit in the IT function. How do we feel about that this year? Yes. Hands up. No hands in the air. Yeah. One. Sorry. <laughs> this two. Oh, it was the opposite. It's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Some people. <laughs> That's not interesting at all. Um, I have a really interesting question here. Um, and and that's, that's, that's why I'm kind of sidestepping off process. But I do still want to hear about your failure, if you can you know, sum it up in a couple of sentences in a, in a short while. Because yeah, sure. we're running, we've got six minutes left. But this is a really nice question. Apart from technology, what has changed in 20 years? Oh, I, I think that our role has changed from being the managers of content to a critical business partner to the business leaders. Which tunes in very much with how you started. Yeah, so yes. we are now yeah. consultants to the business of solving their problems through the better use of knowledge, whether it's in, uh, you know, Can I throw that, testing. how many people of you feel that you are consultants to the business? That's good. Not bad. And how many people feel that you need to become consultants to the business? <laughs> That's not enough. <laughs> um, Gloria, your failure. Um, the failure that I've, I've seen and witnessed so many times at different companies, I'm going to go back to separating where people have discussions and where people work. Um, I don't think that you could have true knowledge sharing without having the conversation about why someone did something a certain way. Um, if, if you have them separated, and I know a lot of people, you know, you imp implement, you know, whatever your ESN is or your community solution or your group solution, it tends to be over here. And everybody is working over here. And right. you, you wonder why it stalls or why people aren't coming back to the ES ESN. It's because they have to stop what they're doing and go somewhere to contribute. So why not integrate it to where they're working? So to me, the failure is not thinking through, how can I make this easier for the end user? How can I, how can I bring right. the discussion in with it? Which with connects the, yeah. actually to what you were saying earlier on about folding yeah. it into the way that works. And, yeah, and I, yeah. I'm guessing that's where you were going with your process. No, but I, I think angle. since we have six minutes, uh, uh, I, the, the important thing, what has changed? Uh, I just to give our example, up to June this year, uh, I was part of the CTO organization where the program, the KM program started 11 years ago. And we were like influential. We were talking to, you know, you should do this, you should do that. 
And we moved, our entire team moved to the CEO organization. And uh, we are now integrated in the business, so we're now intentional. So what we're doing right now and the conversation we're having is how do we embed knowledge management in the business model? And this is a completely different conversation because uh, in professional services, knowledge is what you sell. Knowledge mm -hmm. is the business. And so what we need to do is have this conversation, and I don't use the word I've seen it explicit with my business partner. I use about the know-how and the know-what, you know? Like, mm -hmm. you know, how much of those consultants do we need train on the know-how versus the know-what, okay? What's the balance? How much of this are we going to do? How much of knowledge are we going to repeat? What's the return on investment in you know, creating that knowledge that people, we want people to reuse? And that's the biggest change. I think we, we really are not embedding this into the, into the business and that's mm. where the, the change is. Okay. And on the process, we, just one thing, ask yourself, do you have a process that is described, detailed, that you can share, that you can scale, that you can improve? Because you would not do supply chain management without uh, having a process, or finance without having you know, a process. Why do you think you can do knowledge management without having a, a described process? And it took us to re-engineer all our process and actually detail the process, understand what's the input, what's the output, who is doing what, the RACI, what data do I capture, and so on. It was a massive amount of work we did last year. Now it's documented. We have an end-to-end -end process that is documented. That means it can be reviewed, improved, and it can be taught. It can scale throughout the company. Because yeah. scaling is yeah. the name of the game when you have a large enterprise. And actually, I mean, that's a fair point because change is incredibly difficult if you don't have definition, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and we have one question. I couldn't resist this question. I wasn't going to take another question. But the, this is a beautifully phrased question. Is this panel supposed to focus on change management or is that just a pain point for everybody? Mm. Is that a pain point for everybody? Change management? Yeah. I started with this. I said this is the biggest failure I see is that yeah. people treat change management as a line item of a program. It is the program. You, you, you have to start with change management. Having your stakeholder involved, why, what is the th why do you want to do this? The why, okay? And use a methodology, don't reinvent the rule. I mean, the, the, the game, the rule. <laughs> I'm speaking French and, and <laughs> you, need, you really need to, uh, you know, there's a, there's a methodology, there's proven method of driving change. Use it. Okay. Jay. Can we have a closing comment? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, think, I think we should have a, we've got, uh, no, actually, we're out. We're out of time. What? We're out of time for closing comments. But I do, I, there's another beautiful question I want just to put to you to, uh, for us to think about. Just internalize and think about and keep it to ourselves, uh, which is, um, does understanding how people consume information in a mobile social media world impact KM strategy? And um, I, I'm kind of interpreting that as, as are we too old to do KM? Mm. <laughs> uh, can we thank our panelists? <laughs> and thank, thank you for the questions. Thank you.